And so as I was preparing for this message, I just, uh, I knew that um, what he wanted me to share. And as I began to put it together, I, I seemed to have forgotten to some degree that every time that I began to to work on a message that I'm to deliver corporately to God's people is that he begins to work on me first before I can deliver it to others. And so it always, to some degree, catches me a little bit by surprise as I'm wondering what in the world is going on here. But I'm thankful for the word that he has given to me to share with you. And so uh, I thought we would just open up with another prayer, if you don't mind, more for me than for you, okay? (laughs) So Father, I just thank you for settling my heart. I thank you for the word that you've placed in my heart to share with your people. I think that your word is, is living and active and sharper than two, any, any two-edged sword, that that word is able to divide the soul from the spirit. So I pray in the name of Jesus that this word that comes forth is going to be spirit-led and spirit-fed. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. amen. As we were uh, worshiping the Lord, I just had a, a wonderful experience with God. I just... I just uh, I know that uh, he is here this morning in a special way. He's over, always abiding in a, in a place where he's abided in. But sometimes there's a manifestation or more of a showing up of his spirit when, when we begin to acknowledge that presence in that place. Sometimes we don't acknowledge that presence in that place. And we don't realize that God is with us when we're going through some of the most difficult times in our life. Isn't that true? And as we read the book of Nehemiah, we see that the people of God here had gone their own way, went into exile for a number of years, and now we find them uh, coming back into their land and fulfilling the purposes and the promises of God in their life. And it just is a reminder to us that even though sometimes we feel like we're exiled or that God is not with us any longer because things aren't going the right way, Things are falling apart. Things are, are, uh, seem, to be, seem to be down and out, and there seems to be darkness coming in. I want to let you know that God is faithful to his promise, and he will bring you through. And this story of Nehemiah is a story just like that. And some of us may have felt like we've been exiled for a while, maybe because of our own actions or because of others' actions towards us. But God is here to meet that need, whatever it may be, wherever you're at. Whatever faith you're able to muster up this morning as we hear the word of the Lord, okay? So Levi, Pastor Levi, my pastor, challenged us with with this question last week. What do we need to rebuild in our lives? Why is that important for us? It's important for us to know where the Holy Spirit wants to work. Oftentimes, we find ourselves trying, we see a weakness in in ourselves, we see something we don't like about ourselves, and what do we begin to do? We begin to try to work on it, make it better, right? The unfortunate thing is, is if it's not the starting place for the Holy Spirit, then we're going to do it in ourselves. I used an illustration a number of years ago that we have this tree in our backyard. It's an oak tree. I don't know, I don't remember what kind it is, but it doesn't lose its leaves in the fall like all the other trees in my yard. It waits till right now. I had my yard all cleaned up of most of the leaves that are there, and now my yard is full of leaves again because this tree is beginning to leave, lose its leaves. Why is it beginning to lose its leaves now in the springtime? Because there's new life that is beginning to flow in that tree. And that new life then is beginning to push off those leaves without any effort. At first, I used to be able to beat on that tree and trying to get all those leaves off so I wouldn't have to rake them again later. That didn't work. And that's the way it is with our personal life. We need to know the place that in our life that needs to be rebuilt. And if we are doing it on our own, then we're wasting a lot of energy and time and get frustrated and we begin to give up. But when we begin to know what God is doing already in our life and begin to partner with him, that new life begins to flow. And guess what? It's effortless have those things begin to fall off our life. The second thing that uh, he questioned was, what is the work God has for us, what he has called you to do? We've gone through the inventory of gifts in people's lives, and and some of you have found out some of those gifts, and some of you agree with that, and some of you don't. That's okay. What happens is that God has placed something within you to help make a difference in the generation which you were born in. 
He has gifted you with something that will build up his church, corporally here and universally in the church. You have a large part to play in the body of Christ. And when we don't step up and begin to play that part, then it leaves a void or a hole. Ever put together a puzzle and you get down to the last couple pieces and guess what? They're now where to be found. That's frustrating, isn't it? It leaves out the whole picture. And that's what happens sometimes within the body of Christ. God is wanting to do something in an arena or in an area of life. And certain people are just kind of left out because they've chosen not to use the gifts and talents. But I want you to know that God has a great work for each one of you. And you are unique and special. And only you are shaped to fill that part within the church. Okay, so those two things are important. I didn't want to leave those behind from last week's message that we had. Since retiring, the reality, for some of you who don't know, I retired about six months ago. You never really retired when you're a Christian, but, but uh, you know, when you retire, you kind of fade into the sunset. You go find something else to do other than what you used to do. And I know I've talked to some of the people who have retired and they've traveled and they played, took up golf. I've tried both of those, and none of those seem to suit very well. But there's, there's that, that sense within me that even at, at 66, I want to make sure that my life counts for something. I notice more than ever that life is passing quickly. And as, as I've gotten older, that I realize that, you know, I probably don't have another 28 years of ministry left, even though that's what I've spent in the, in the years that I've been here. And so, so I ponder how quickly life is, is passing by. And I want to, in these latter years of life, I want them to be greater than the former years. There's a promise in the Bible that I'm holding on to that, that I want to make a difference with my life. And I hope that's true for you. I want to do something that's lasting, something of leaving a legacy behind me. And, and you know what? I could tell you that I was... I was good and, and did everything right when I was growing up, even into my young adult years, but my wife is here and she would know that I'm lying to you. So it isn't about what we're able to do or what we have done that I'm talking about. It's what matters from this day forward. What is going to be your choice for your life this day forward? Because God can do amazing things with a span of life that maybe even be a few years that he will use you to make a difference and to leave the legacy that you're hoping to leave because you have been put on this earth for a purpose. So how can I spend my life so it counts? And so this is the answer that I came up with. When we begin to spend our lives the way that they count is to see what God and his purposes is all about. When we begin to understand and connect with the purpose that God created you for, then your life not only counts for now, but it'll count for eternity. I believe Nehemiah 7 carries some of the ways that we can live our lives with with a godly purpose. Chapter 7 serves as a pivotal point. It's a, it's a, It's a changing of purposes that God had for Nehemiah when he first came. Remember when he first came from chapters 1 to chapter 6, there is a a focus and the attention is given. This godly purpose was to do what? Rebuild the walls, right? And we find out at the end of chapter 6 that this purpose has been fulfilled and is finished. Now, this next few chapters, chapter 7, all the way to the rest of the book, what is it, 13? We find out that Nehemiah has a new purpose to begin to to put his attention to and his efforts towards. And it just was for me, as I was putting this together, I had a purpose when I first moved to the Yakima Valley in 1987, and that was, I was called to build the church of Jesus Christ. It happened to be a four-square church, the denomination that I was connected with. And, 
And so now that that focus and attention has been accomplished for my part that I was to play in it, it doesn't mean now that I can retire from doing anything, that I can rest and relax because that part of the, of the purpose that I was called here is finished. But now I've wakened my senses say, okay, what is the next thing I'm to do? And this is what Nehemiah is doing in chapter 7. He's beginning to awaken to, okay, this is a finished and accomplished purpose, but this is really just a building block for what was to come. Because the first part of the, of the book is about rebuilding the walls. Second part is about rebuilding the people within the walls, which is so much more important to God and to the purposes he has for the people of Jerusalem. After accomplish this one purpose, it's needful for us to know and understand that some of us have had seasons of life where some wonderful things were done for God. And there's a tendency to say, you know what, I, I taught Sunday school. I'm retired. Or I've, I've ministered to the ladies. Or I've ministered to the youth. Or there's areas that we maybe have already done and done them well. And be able to say, you know, I've already done that. Now I'm move, ready to move on to something else of my choosing. And when we begin to do that, then we miss out on the, on, the, on the purposes and the fulfillment that God has through fulfilling his purposes that we're able to, to live in. Because I want to feel fulfilled each and every day. It doesn't happen always. I sometimes wondered and kind of wished that, that working with people was like working on the, on the cars. I was, I was a mechanic for 20 years. I got them all fixed up. They were running good, and I felt like I accomplished something for the day, and I'd go on and say, that is finished. But when you're working with people, guess what? It's not that simple. You begin to work on people, and I'm working on the same issue for about 10 years. You know, (laughs) you're wondering, am I doing any good here? But there's something on the inside when you just do what God wants you to do without looking for results that you're coming up with, and maybe the world would would view or evaluate as this is what is successful, this is what is good, if we don't fall into that trap, then there's a sense of I did what I was supposed to do today and be able to lay your head upon the pillow and feel fulfilled for that day. And that's what I want for everyone that is here. You are to live a life that matters and that counts. You are extraordinary. You know why? Because God made you in his image. That's why. We're not to just be wandering around, not accomplishing anything with our life. You are made for a purpose. And that's what Nehemiah 7 is is talking about here. He was a cupbearer. He wasn't anybody really special, but God chose him to come and fulfill his purposes, to fulfill a promise to a people that he had been gathering all these years. We're going to read chapter 7 and verse 1. And... uh, I had to break this up. <laughs> I made a joke with my son about the chapter that he ended up giving me it has all these wonderful names in it. And so I divided this up so that our first, my first slide is going to be one verse. So it's not going to take very long to read this. Verse one is, now when the wall was rebuilt and I had set up the doors and the gatekeepers and the singers, the Levites then were appointed. The Levites are what? Priests, Okay the priestly tribe. So what is God's purpose here? Nehemiah is appointing the gatekeepers, and that's these three lines here, the singers, and the what? Priests, okay? That's on your study guide there. If you don't have one, there's one in the back. So he's, he's, he's appointed these gatekeepers, singers, and priests. And all these positions which he has appointed is for one purpose, Okay? This may be something that you don't catch at first, but let me, just, uh, let me just share this with you. What was the reason for raising up the gatekeepers? They were to do what? They were, they were there to, to guard the city, to protect the city from, uh, especially it goes on to say later that it is in vulnerable times, you keep those gates closed, station people in front of their houses, they were there to help protect the city and, and make the people feel like they're safe there, to bring security to that area, right? 
Now, why was that needed? I, I feel like this is more than a responsibility of keeping people safe. And tying this in, what, it, what was God's purpose for the city? Because this is, in essence, why he chose these three at the beginning of that chapter, to fulfill God's purpose for the city. And so when you connect the gatekeepers with the singers, with the priests, there's something of a larger picture than providing just security for that city, right? And what do you think God's purpose was for that city? So that they could then begin to be, begin their, their, their priestly duties, right, within the temple. The sacrificial systems would, would once commence but what was, those are just extras. Those were there in place so that the worship of God could take place within the city once again. So the grand purpose of God for Nehemiah was connecting with is, okay, I need to appoint these three groups. So there won't be distractions during our time of worship. I'm going to set the gatekeepers there. And I'm going to have those designated singers, which will help lead the congregants to be able to worship God. And then we're going to have the priests who are going to offer those sacrifices on behalf of the people so that God could dwell again amongst his people. So this is the focus and the attention of where Nehemiah is going as he's establishing these three positions for that one purpose. This is why I say that as we look back over the scriptures, and I'm going to give you a bunch here, so... You can write them down or not, but it's just trying to make a point of why I've come up with the conclusion that I've come up with as we begin on this first, first slide. In Genesis 12, 3, God is looking for one man that he was going to bring a nation out of. What was his name? Abraham. Simple, right? And he told him that he was going to bring a great nation out of him. And in doing, making this great nation, Abraham, he says, I'm going to give you a, a land, a promised land that you're going to take this nation to, okay? So this is uh, a promised land where the blessings that God had given Abraham or promised to give Abraham was going to be a blessing that would be a blessing upon, for, on the earth for all the families, right? So we move on to Exodus 19, and a lot has taken place, right? Abraham had one son, and then, and then we move on to Jacob, who had 12 sons, and he becomes Israel, and, and, uh, and one of his sons gets shipped off to uh, Egypt, and so it's there that he begins to, to move through the, the pit, uh, preachers in training, you know, moving all the way up to being the second in charge of Pharaoh, and, and it's there that he brings his family who had sold him into slavery, back into Egypt. And it's there in Egypt that that one man turns into a nation of a few million people over the 400 years that they were stuck there. So now Moses is raised up to deliver his people and to take them out of Egypt, right? And take them where? To that promised land that was promised to Abraham. Now, this promised land was a land flowing with milk and honey, right? Sounds like a wonderful place to go to. And it's there that he promises Moses in, in the wilderness. He gathers Moses together with the people in Exodus 19, 5 through 6. And he says to this one nation that is gathered before him, that you are my own possession. You are my treasure. And I want you to be a kingdom of priests, not just a tribe of priests. But God's original idea was that the whole nation would be, be priests to him. But what did they say when they seen God beginning to manifest himself upon the mountain? There's fire and there's smoke and there's loud thundering. They told Moses, you better go talk to him and you talk to us, Okay. And so doing, God began, and there's other stuff that took on. I don't have time to get into that because I'm still on my first slide. But it turns out that, that uh, this was God's heart, is that the whole nation would be priests to him. That's found in Exodus 19, 5 through 6. Now in Exodus 25, 
God wants Moses then to do what? To build a what? This is an easy one. Tabernacle. That word tabernacle means to, to dwell among, right? And so God says here in 25 verse 8 that I want you to build me a tabernacle or a sanctuary so that I may dwell amongst my people. So first, he wants the whole nation to be priests. Secondly, it's his heart and desire is not to just have a nation out here. His heart is, because of he is a God of love, is to do what? Dwell amongst his people. He wants to interact with his people. Now, 2 Samuel chapter 5, we see that David now... And, and again, after, after Moses does what he does, he's not able to go into the promised land. Joshua follows him. They've gone into the promised land. They've done their conquering. But they really haven't, they haven't conquered everything within that promised land. And so here, in 2 Samuel 5, David comes in, and he finds this place, a strategic place to himself. And he goes in and he conquers the Jebusites. Now, we've come to know that the area where the Jebusites were, my son shared this some time ago, that area where the Jebusites was, was the place where Jerusalem now resides. Okay? Now, David conquered it for, because it was a strategic place. But God was moving in his heart because God had a spiritual purpose for that place. Genesis 22, we'll go back there, where Abraham is called to offer his son Isaac upon which mount? Mount Moriah, right? And he gets up there and his son says, you know, he's, he's, he's considered maybe a teenager or an early 20s. And, and he's, he's not a, a dumb guy by any means, but he sees the fire and he sees the wood. He goes, but where's the sacrifice, Dad? And what does Abraham say? God will provide. Ties the guy up, puts him on the altar. He's ready to kill him. An angel of the Lord appears to him and tells him, don't do it. Now that we know that you fear the Lord. And he looked and he found a ram in the thicket. And that was the sacrifice. And where did this take place? What mountain? Mount Moriah, 2 Chronicles chapter 3, verse 1. Solomon is called to build a temple. And it says here in chapter 3, verse 1, that the place that he was ordered of the Lord to build this temple was where? Mount Moriah. Which later on would be the place where the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world would be crucified many hundreds of years later. When Moses was going through the wilderness in Deuteronomy 12, I'm not going to take time to turn there. When Moses was going through the wilderness, the Lord spoke to him. And he says, when you go into this place, this new land, and when you begin to settle it and feel safe and secure there, I have this place that I want to place my name on so that it will dwell there. This place, he said there. Fast forward hundreds of years to when Solomon is ready to He's already built the temple, and he now is dedicating the temple to the Lord. You can read about it in 1 Kings chapter 8. He goes back to the words that were spoken to Moses and says, this is the place you have designated that you will put your name on forever. A strategic place but a spiritually important place. I believe with all my heart that that city was to be a place of worship. 
the worship that was to go out from that place to all the world. That was the reason for his existence in the first place, the dwelling place of God, where God could dwell amongst his people and be worshiped there. Now in the New Testament, that dwelling place of God has changed, hasn't it? From a temple that was built by man's hands to a temple built by God's hands. Those of us who have chosen to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, it tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and chapter 6, that we now have become the temple of God. And if we are the temple of God, then we are to be a place where worship takes place. That's the primary purpose of our existence as a temple of God. Of God. Do you believe that? When I say worship, what comes to your mind? Unfortunately for many, it's, it's just what we did this morning is just singing the songs. Those songs are just a way of getting our attention to be given to the Lord instead of what we just came from. And that experience that happens between the songs where we don't have the words to follow is when true worship can really evolve within our life. What we read about in the book of, of Revelations, chapter 4, that a good part of the time in heaven is going to be spent worshiping God. It says in Revelations 4.8 that day and night, day and night, they do not cease worshiping the Lord, saying, we sang it this morning, holy, 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 the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come, over and over and over again. Gary Larson, I think is his name. Anybody know him? Writes a cartoon? Okay. Okay. He writes the far side cartoon. And in one of his cartoons, he has this gentleman sitting on a cloud with a harp. And he's just sitting there, and you know how they put the caption up here? It says, I should have brought a magazine. <laughs> Unfortunately, many Christians feel that way about worship. I want you to think back when you came across a scene of, of a natural beauty. Maybe it was a sunset. Maybe it was a, a waterfall that caught you by surprise. Or I remember when we were at Gary and Lynn's, one, uh, one day it had been raining, and we stepped out, and you can see a long ways because we're kind of up on a hill, but there was this beautiful, vibrant, double rainbow with all its colors bright. <laughs> And there was something about being able to see something that beautiful that just caused you to go, wow, right? Have you seen it? Have you experienced it in nature? We do that because beauty creates a spontaneous awe in us. And it's, it's something that's best experienced when it's shared with somebody else, isn't it? We were calling each other, come here, look at this, how beautiful it is. And we could just stand there in awe and look at the beauty that was created. And I came across this quote that goes along with this. It says, it says, when a believer fails to connect in worship, When a believer fails to connect and worship, they fail to see the stunning beauty and the love and the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ. When you connect with worship, the eyes of your heart are opened and you're receptive then to all that the Lord has done 
and the sacrifice of giving himself upon the cross, laying aside his, his robes of glory in heaven, coming to this earth, loved us while we were yet sinners, dying for us, and making available through his grace a free gift, a get-out-of-jail card. If we would just accept him into our heart and yield our life to what he wants to do with us. And as I was sitting here, I had tears in my eyes as we sang that. I think it was the third song that had to do with that. I've gone my way many times, and I know that I'll still continue to go my way. I know that he loves me more than I love, my, than I love him, and I'm thankful for that. I would hate him for to love me in the way I love him, right? Because my love oftentimes is conditional. But his love is unconditional. And when you catch just a glimpse, when the eyes of your heart are opened up, to the wonder, the majesty, the beauty, the splendor of who God is and his love for you. You can't help be caught off guard. You can't help to be awestruck. And then yield yourself in that awe to worship him. Proskaneto means to bow low and to kiss. It's an intimate term that we get drawn into when we begin to witness who God is and what he has done for us. That's what worship is all about. And for me, worship is best experienced when it's shared with one another, which is what we did this morning. This was the godly purpose for the city and the godly purpose for every believer. And if we want a life that counts for God, then we need to be able to grow as a worshiper before God. Because heaven is going to be a time of drinking in the infinite beauty of the Lord. That is why they don't see stay and night. They get a fresh glimpse of who God is again and again and again. Day and night they do not cease worshiping him. And we know David had a heart of a worshiper, right? He had a heart after God. What does it say about him in Psalms 27? Verse 4. David, as a, a true worshiper, says this. This one thing I ask of the Lord. And this one thing I will seek all the days of my life. What is it? To dwell in the house of the Lord forever. But not just to dwell there. He wasn't content with that, was he? And we can't be just content to dwell in the house of the Lord. Because a true worship passes, presses past that. Not only dwelling in the house of the Lord, but it was to behold the beauty of the Lord. That's what made him a true worshiper because he sought to behold the beauty of the Lord in the experiences that he came through. Oftentimes you read in the Psalms, man, it's a downer to read some of his Psalms, isn't it? But by the time you get it to the other end, I mean, there's a time of, of just pouring out your heart because you feel those are so discouraged. You feel like everybody's against you and you feel like the world is coming down on top of you. But when you get to the end, he has that expression. He needs to get that out. But at the end, he makes a choice. And all of a sudden, there's uplifting that begins to happen. There's a refocusing of what my life is about. He begins to magnify the Lord. So as he magnifies the Lord or brings the Lord closely, then all that other stuff gets pushed to the side where it should be. That's the heart of a worshiper. And that was the importance of putting these things in order first, of appointing these three positions. Now, Nehemiah chapter two and verse chapter seven and verse two, verse two. One more verse again. Then I put Hananiah, my brother, and Hananiah, Hananiah, my brother, and Hananiah, the commander of the fortress in charge of Jerusalem, for he was a faithful man and he feared God more than many. <laughs> All right, and so Nehemiah picked two men. 
Penani was probably his blood brother. And it says in, in uh, chapter one of Nehemiah that this is probably the same guy who came to Nehemiah and told him what the conditions of the walls were and got him moving in the direction. God used him as a messenger to bring Nehemiah to Jerusalem. And probably again, his blood brother. And so he was to be appointed over the civic leadership of the, of the, of the place. Hananias, on the other hand, was appointed the military leader over the place. So we see Nehemiah is delegating responsibility to others, and he isn't looking for the most talented, which is what a tendency we have to do, right? The most talented, he isn't looking for the best looking or the most powerful. What are the elements he's looking for? He's looking for godly character, right? And so he picks out these two individuals because they had godly character. He placed them in a place of responsibility. And so these are the two words that, that it shares that they, he was looking for in these two men. He picked these two because they were what? Faithful and God-fearing or fearful, okay? So we look at this, and I, let me give you the definition of faithful, for under the, the lines there, it's reliable, it's truthful, and it's being firm or unwavering. That's the definition to faithful. To be fearful means to res be respectful, to be reverent, or to be in awe. And that's the way that that these are in this, in this particular uh, order here. Reliable, what does that mean to us? It speaks of, of someone that you can depend upon, someone you can lean on. Have you ever had friends who, who uh, you know, were best buddies and, and you go to sit down in a chair and what do they do? Pull it out from under you. I had an issue that I needed theophostics on myself one time because I had an issue with an elder who was in the church at one time years ago. Don't try to guess who it was. And uh, he walked out and he was angry with me over a message I had preached. I mean, he was, his countenance was down and, and he lashed out. And my heart was open just receiving people at the end after the service and I was hugging him and loving him. And all of a sudden, you know, ready to hug this guy and man, he lashed out and all of a sudden, I was hurt. And I'm in the ins inside of my heart, it was like, why'd he do that? And I thought, well, he's just hurt. Something happened. Something I said, you know, or whatever else. And uh, it's okay. I forgive him. At the end of the day, I'm angry. I want to see God do something to him. Hurt him. And so I go through this cycle, and then I begin to realize, why did what he say affect me so much? And during the middle of the night where theophosics works best means God's light. It's, it's a prayer ministry that Mary and I do. And so I asked the Lord, I can't shake this. I've forgiven the guy and I can't shake it. I'm hurting on the inside. And I don't like feeling this way. I don't like holding things against people. And the Lord took me back to when I was in fourth grade. And here I was, a shy, I mean, was very, very, very shy with one of my best buddies that we played handball with all the time as kids. And, and we're standing behind the building and there's these girls around me and, and, and him. And I mean, I couldn't say a word in front of girls at that time. And he kneeled down to tie his shoe, I thought. And when he kneeled down, he pulled my feet from under me. Hit the ground. And I run around the corner and I just cry. God brought that back to me and it was the same emotions that I was feeling towards this other person. It was a betrayal that had taken place. Embarrassed me. Rejected. Betrayal. And I forgave him there and that next day I was able to just rejoice and let things go. But God was after something in my heart. He wanted to take something. He wanted to heal a part of my, my past life so that he could have more of me. And I yielded that to him 
at that time. God is looking for reliable people, people that you can depend upon to put in leadership, people you can lean on. And, and my son, a couple of year, uh, weeks ago, he, was, he stood here and he asked for forgiveness as a representative of those who have been in leadership who have hurt you, misused you, taken advantage of you. And we believe that was of the Lord for you to be able then to go ahead and forgive them and release them and give them over to God. Secondly, they need to be truthful. That word truthful means to speak the truth. That if they promise they're going to do something, guess what? They do it. Isn't that a novel idea? Truthful. Isn't that one of the names of the Lord? Truth, way, truth, and life. That when they promised they're going to do something, they did it. No excuses. They were firm, unwavering. That what you see is what you get. They're not one way in public and another way in private, right? If you want a life, that counts for God, we must become a faithful person. And here's the secret to this. It's a fruit of the Holy Spirit. It isn't something that we can make happen on our own. It's a quality of God. I was looking up these verses this morning because they just popped in my head that Lamentations 3 is is. His loving kindness is everlasting and his mercies are new every morning. What's the next line? Great is his faithfulness. When you think about 1 John 1, 9, the promise that if we confess our sins, he is what? Faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Or Revelations 19 when the Lord is ready to come back on that white stallion. It says that his name is faithful and true. It's a quality that we can't live a godly life without. As we walk in dependency upon the Holy Spirit, Galatians 5.11 and Galatians 5.22, then that fruit will begin to bloom in its season. It's just making ourselves available to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit, to walk in step with him and stop telling him, no, I want to do it myself. Little Noah, my granddaughter, who is two years old, I love her to death. She's at that place where I can't help her put on her shoes. I can't help her put on her coat. She doesn't want help going down a big slide. I want to do it myself. And oftentimes, even though we've walked with the Lord a long time, or something that still rises in all of us, the old man, I got this, Lord. I want to do this myself. But faithfulness is dependent on the working and the leading of the Holy Spirit. It's a gift from him. Luke 16, 10, Jesus goes on to say, when you are faithful with the little things, then much more will come. And so if we have not been experiencing the much more, we need to reevaluate our life and seeing and going back, are we faithful with what God has entrusted to us? So the question is, are we reliable, truthful, unwavering as a husband, as a wife, as a parent, the way that we use our finances, the way that we use our time. Because faithfulness goes into all areas of our life. Here's a quote that I came across that most people who complain that they do not have time for the godly purposes in their life are not being faithful in the little things God has entrusted them with. I had to laugh when Mary was doing her study and little Samantha came in 
And Mary goes, did you do your study? What was her response? No, I had to go to my aunts. I had to go do this. And I just had to chuckle because it fit right into my sermon. We have all of these excuses of why we don't read our Bible or why we don't spend a lot of time with the Lord or why whatever else he's asked us to do. Are you being faithful with the little things God has entrusted to you? And when you are, there is a promise from Jesus that says, I have so much more I want to give to you. If you allow this quality, this gift of the Holy Spirit, his fruit to begin to blossom within your life. Second quality has to do with uh, the fear of the Lord. Proverbs 1 7 is that the fear of God grows out of knowledge of God. So when you begin to know who God is, there's something of a fear, uh, a respect, a reverence, or an awe that begins to develop there. One definition goes like this that when you begin to comprehend who God is, when you get a glimpse, of who he is through a time of prayer, a time of, of reading the word, or a time of, of, of worshiping or singing songs to him, it has a humbling effect on our soul. When you just get a glimpse of who he is, even just a glimpse, wasn't it Moses in Exodus 33? says, I want to see your whole face. I want to see all of you. And God says, nobody can see my face and live, but I'll tell you, I'll do you this. Exodus 34, I'll go by, I'll put my hand up, I'll put you in that cleft of the rock. And then as I go by, I'll give you a glimpse of my back. What an amazing picture that must have been. Because when Moses got that glimpse, he couldn't stand upright. It says that he fell prostrate and began to worship God. Some of us that had that glimpse know what I'm talking about. A sense in driving in your car, listening to an old hymn, a sense of, of just being able to be with someone who encourages and strengthens you. And you begin to tear up. Got a glimpse of his love for you. That's what brings forth the fear of the Lord in one's life. I know that when I was young, all the way up into my adulthood, and still one of my struggles is the fear of man. But God said this, or Jesus said this in the New Testament, Don't fear man who can kill the body, but fear the one who can kill the body and the soul. Who is he talking about? God, right? We've been going through this book on Thursday nights, and you're all invited to come if you're not a part of a home group, called uh, Breaking Intimidation. And most of us who are in the group feel like all of us have fallen under this being intimidated by people. And when you're intimidated, then you exchange your authority to those who intimidate you, and then they use that authority against you. But he writes this in his book here on page five. He says, on and on these thoughts assaulted my mind. He's talking about being intimidated by a group of people within a church. My fears had begun to center on one thought. What is going to happen to me? Because when we fear man then where's our attention? It's on ourselves, right? What's going to happen to me? This is how intimidation will change your focus. The reason is the root of intimidation is fear, and fear causes people to focus on themselves. But it tells us, and this is one of my life verses, 1 Corinthians, I mean 1 John 4, 18, I think it is, that perfect love does what? Perfect love casts out fear because love puts the focus on God and others and denies itself. So it takes the focus off of ourselves. And where's our focus on? The love of God. And when our our 
focus is on the love of God, then there's no place to be worried about what's going to happen to us because we know God's going to take care of us because we have, we have an idea of how much he loves us and how much he'll take care of us. Anybody who loves something is going to take care of them and cover and protect them, right? And so that's the importance of understanding and knowing the love of God. That's what's going to help you to fear the Lord. You have to experience that love before you can develop a fearing for him. Does that make sense? It isn't something that we can do out of our will. We can't make ourselves fear God. It's never going to happen. But when you begin to experience his love and focus on his love, I can tell you how the Lord delivered me from the spirit of fear. It was an actual spirit. I went through deliverance because I was focusing on the Lord. I don't have time for that, but it's there for you if you're still being wrapped up and confined by fear, okay? Okay. So, let me move on to chapter, uh, chapter 3. Um, Nehemiah, not chapter 3, third verse. Nehemiah 7, 3, and I'm only going to read through 7. I'm not brave enough to read through the rest of the chapter. So, you can breathe a sigh of relief because I can't even pronounce most of those words. But let me read here. Nehemiah says, Then I said to them, Do not let the gates of Jerusalem be open until the sun is hot and while they are standing guard. Let them shut and bolt the doors. Also appoint guards from the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Each at his own point, post and each is in front of his own house. So why was he looking for these guards to be set up and not to open up the gates till it's hot? Because people were still resting. They're not in place to be uh, ready to guard. And so he wanted the gates closed up. He wanted to be careful and, and to uh, not allow the gates to be open when we're vulnerable. And, and this speaks spiritually, of course, to us is oftentimes we need to be vigilant. We need to be on the alert when we're feeling the most vulnerable. We need to make watching over the gates of our mouth, the gates of our ears, and the gates of our eyes when the enemy is really wanting to come in and take advantage of us. We have to set a guard over those things when we're vulnerable because it says in 1 Peter 5, 8 that, that the, uh, be on the alert, the devil is like a roaring lion. He's seeking who he may devour. He's always on the watch to see if you're down, to see if you're tired, to see if, if this little excuse will be used to be able to tangle you up, and that sin that so easily entangles you. So be careful to guard yourself in those times of vulnerability and get the partner, somebody that you can call on and say, you know what, I need prayer right now, or, or text this is great because you can text them and don't feel like you're bothering anybody. Say, I need prayer. You don't have to tell them what it's about, but they'll stand with you. And there's something about the power of prayer that breaks those bonds that the enemy is trying to put upon you. Something about two or three gathering together in prayer, right? So let's move on to prayer. Uh, I mean, number uh, four. Now the city was large and spacious, but the people in it were few and the houses were not built. Then my God put it into my heart to assemble the nobles, the officials and the people to be enrolled by genealogies. Then I found the book of genealogy of those who came up first in which I found the following records. These are the, one, uh, the people of the province who came up from the captivity of the exiles. Who, uh, did, <laughs> uh, forgive me. I can see I'm a corner of my eye when I accidentally burnt my wife but looked up like this. I apologize for that. So these are the people of the province who came up from the captivity of the exiles uh, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried away and who returned to Jerusalem and Judah, each to his own city and who came up with Zerubbabel. So what we see here is, uh, I know there's a temptation and I'm not going to take the time to read through the rest of these, these names here. But I just wanted to stop there because I think this is important from our third point on the study guide there, that uh, I begin to wonder why in the world is, is the Lord tormenting us with having all of these, these names? Somebody said it, re it reads like a Hebrew phone book. You know, you just, I remember when I was, and I'm not advocating anything here, but I was, when I watch TV, I like to see what's on about four channels, five channels, to see, okay, am I missing anything? And here's, I see uh, Homer uh, Simpson sitting in his underwear on the couch. And uh, the thing that made me stop for that channel for a second is because he's holding the Holy Bible. 
in his hand. And he's reading the Bible. And, and the funny thing was, of course, is he's reading so-and-so begat so-and-so. So many begat so-and-so. And then they kind of draw a line like time has gone by. And he's still reading the same thing over and over again. It's kind of com- conveying to everybody else that the Bible has nothing really to say to us, you know. So this is just what that kind of remember. But it's interesting that God put this in not only in one place in the scriptures, but he also put a similar list. It's not identical, but it's really similar to the names that are written here in the book of Ezra, chapter 2. So why would God take two different books in the Old Testament and take up this space so that we would have it today in our hands? So it must be important, right? Genealogy must be important. It shows us that individual names are important to God. And they all have a part to play in his story. This genealogy are important because they prove the blood tie and the covenant tie between God and his people. It's a proof for them to read. So why is this important? It's important because out of these genealogies that were to be kept over and over and over in the Old Testament, it was important because when Jesus came, he proved his genealogy. That was the importance of putting it in the book of Matthew and the book of Luke, going all all the way back from who Jesus is, all the way back to Adam. It showed that he fulfilled the prophecy as the Messiah because he came from the tribe of Judah and from the lineage of David. That was one of the important issues of why genealogy is important throughout the Scripture, other than that it matters to God. Each individual matters to God. Although they they don't mean much to us, it's a reminder for us today that individuals that we pass by every day, sometimes never giving them the time of day, sometimes the broken, the hurting, the forgotten of society. But they matter to God. And if they matter to God, they need to matter to us. Is that right? We have a plaque over our bed, and it says that he has engraved his name upon the palm of his hand, Isaiah 49, 16. And I love that, having that over our bed as a reminder. He knows exactly where we're at. He knows exactly what we're going through. Verse 5, God puts in Nehemiah's heart to check the genealogy to see who is qualified to repopulate the city and provide for the temple worship. He uses this list not only to determine who's going to come and fill the city, to repopulate the city, who's going to serve in the temple, but I believe there's another purpose for him to be able to read that and to share with the people. I believe that other purpose was to show them that they had an identity as a people of God, that they had a purpose to their life as a people of God. And as Christians, we ourselves, we have our physical lineage for some of us, for some of us we don't, But it's not nearly as important as our spiritual lineage, is it? We need to know that we are a part of the the family of God. There's words like in the Bible that that says that we have been engrafted in. We have been adopted. We are in Christ, which speaks about us being in the family of God. And that is ever important. First Peter, if you'd turn over there with me. First Peter chapter 2 and verses 9 and 10 says this. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, 
a holy nation, a people for God's own possessions. Where did we hear these words before? That was God's original plan for the people he had brought out of Egypt, right? A chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellence of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. For you once were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. It's not getting what we deserve. (laughs) So how do you know you're a part of the family of God? I put these scriptures here in the third slide. John 3, 16, that God so loved the world. Right? You believe that? He so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, who is Jesus, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but they shall have everlasting life. Right? Romans 3.23 says that all have sinned. All of us are in the same boat and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23 says that wages of those sins that we've all done is death, but there's a free gift, and that gift is God's Son, right? Which is going to give us eternal life. Romans 10, 9, and 10 says that if we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. So if we confess with our mouth Jesus is Lord, believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we're going to be saved. So John 14, 6 says, I am the way, truth, and the life, Jesus says. No man comes to the Father but by me. So he is the only way to be able to come to the Heavenly Father. So has there been a time in your life that you know without a doubt, I have made that commitment? Is there a time in your life that says, I have yielded my life to Christ, I've invited him into my life, I've asked him for forgiveness, I've repented of my sins, which means I've turned from the life that I was going, pleasing myself, to turning to the way that God wants to have his way in my life, that I was created for a purpose, and I want to live out that purpose, I want it to count, I want to be significant for something. Has there been a time like that in your life? It says here back in in Nehemiah, this is the last verse I'm going to read for you here. Verse 64. It shares about some names here. 61 through 63, I'm not going to pronounce those, but in 64 it says, these searched amongst their ancestral registration or their genealogies. But it could not, they could not locate their name. Therefore, they were considered unclean and excluded from the priesthood. So they couldn't prove by the lineage that they were a part of God's special possession or God's people. That brought to mind about Matthew 7, 22 through 23. When Jesus is talking to the crowd, many will say in that day, what day is he talking about? Judgment day. Many will say in that day, Lord, Lord, Did we not prophesy or speak on your behalf, your name? In your name, cast out devils, and in your name, perform many miracles? I thought we had a relationship going here. I was doing the best I can. I was certainly better than so-and-so. On that day, many will say, Lord, Lord. But in the end, he will say, Depart from me, for I never knew you. Because they never made a time to ask Jesus into their heart. There wasn't a specific time or place that they could identify. I've gone to church all my life. 
found out that that didn't mean much to me later on. I had to have a time when I surrendered myself to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and ask him for the forgiveness of sins. Do you have a time like that that you can point back to? Revelations 3 and verse 5 and Revelations 20 verse 15 talks about the Lamb's book of life. The Lamb's book of life. My question to end this today is, is your name in it? I hope so. If not, today is a great day to be saved. A great day to invite Jesus into your heart and get this neat meet and know this lover of your soul. Would you just stand with me? We're going to prepare our hearts for communion this morning. And we're going to ask the Lord to speak to your heart. And if there be anything in there that's kind of keeping you, not kind of, but keeping you from having that closeness of a relationship with him, that's keeping you from experiencing the worship that he wants to have with you, would you just submit and give that over to him right now in the name of Jesus? Would you surrender to him? I came to a point in my life that, man, I messed it up so much. It's like I had to give it over to somebody else because I wasn't doing very good on my own. But when I began to surrender it fully and completely to Him, and it took time to get to that place where I was surrendering it all because there was just segments. Yeah, I'll give you this, Lord. Okay, I'm going to give you this. I'm going to give you this. Would you start that process today? Would you ask Him? If you've never asked Him into your Lord or, or into your heart, maybe there's, there's been a long time and you've gone your own way for a little while and you're coming back to Him. Let today be a day that signifies, I want to make sure that my name is written in the Lamb's book of life. I want to know without a doubt that He knows my name. I certainly don't want it to be a surprise at the end. So if you want to know this Jesus I've been talking about, if you've never met him, or you want to recommit your life to the Lord, I'm going to invite you to step forward, and we're going to pray with you. Or if there's other areas of struggle within your life, anything you want prayer for, we're not here to condemn you. We're here to stand with you and see God's purposes released in your life. We want your life to count and to matter. We want your life to leave a legacy, and it doesn't matter what's gone on before. Today is a new day. It's a new beginning for you. So would you say yes to him? It's up to you. We're going to have two songs of worship. Let your spirit unite with his. And we're going to pass out the communion. Make sure that your heart is right before the Lord. This is representative of the great sacrifice he made. We take the cup of the juice because of the blood that was shed on our behalf. Without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sins, Hebrews says. And then the bread speaks of the brokenness of his body on Calvary. Resurrection Sunday, which is coming in at the end of the month. This is what this points to. It's a reminder. We do this in remembrance of what he has done for us. And let it open up a glimpse of who he is to you as we partake of it. And begin to thank him. Let your heart be filled up with gratitude for the great love 